All right, we are going to give an opportunity for everybody to start trickling in here. Okay, perfect. We'll give it another minute here. Welcome, welcome everybody. All right, I will um, start with housekeeping items. Um, so hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar, public feedback on certification requirements for software modelers and model reviewers presented by the ABIPSA USA Certification Committee. Um, today's uh, session will be recorded and available through the ABIPSA USA YouTube channel. And if you have any questions hearing the presentation, please try calling in by phone instead of using the computer audio. This is a Zoom webinar, so you can participate by posting questions and comments in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be viewable by all attendees, and there is an option to submit anonymously if you prefer. We, ha uh, we will have the Q&A section towards the end of the webinar to address your questions, but feel free to input them as we go along. You can also upvote or comment on questions that resonate with you. We welcome your questions, thoughts, and ideas as we continue to work towards ABIPSA USA's mission of fostering the better building buildings through simulation. And I would like to introduce today's panelists, Dimitri Kontianis. Um, Dimitri is the president of Model Efficiency, a consulting company specializing in energy modeling, BEM education, and using BEM analysis for research and development of energy codes. He has served on the ABIPSA USA Board of Directors for six years, is a member of the ABIPSA USA Education Committee, and is the chair of ABIPSA USA's Certification Committee. He is the lead developer of the BEM education website, BEMcyclopedia. Next is Maria Cartman. Maria has over 20 years of experience in building science, energy modeling, and energy code. She is a voting member of the ASHRAE Standard 90.1, 140, and 229P committees. Maria led development of the simulation guidelines for the EPA Energy Star multifamily high-rise program and multiple large-scale modeling-based initiative incentive programs um, and defined modeling requirements for the performance-based paths of compliance with the New York and Massachusetts stretch codes. She served as the lead investigator on research studies in support of energy code development, comparing mainstream building energy rating and labeling protocols and assessing gaps in the BEM software testing in respect to compliance and modeling. Uh, Maria developed curriculum for and has conducted numerous training courses on the energy code and energy modeling for new and existing buildings. She holds advanced degrees in mechanical engineering and computer science and is the principal of Carpment Consulting. Next is Tim McDowell. Uh, Timothy P. McDowell is Vice President at Sales O'Brien, where he leads the TRNSYS development team and is a member of the Energy Modeling Group. He is a member of the ABIPSA USA Board of Directors and, is, and currently serves as the treasurer. He also participates on the ABIPSA USA Certification Building Data Exchange Conferences and Finance and Development Committees. Next, we have Alan May. Alan is the simulation team technical leader at Cyclone Energy Group, um, a Chicago-based multidisciplinary energy engineering consulting firm. He works extensively on building simulation projects, including energy modeling, CFD, and daylight. He is a PE, BEMP, CEM, LEED, AP, and ICC certified commercial energy plans examiner. Under his leadership, his team has successfully handled hundreds of energy code submissions to authorities having jurisdictions, or AHJs, across the nation. Currently, Alan serves on the board of directors at IBIPSA USA. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to our speakers.
All right, thank you for those introductions, Jackie, and thanks to everyone for attending the webinar today. Um, should be sharing now. Um, we're very excited to share our committee's work with you today, and we look forward to your feedback. Um, if you're not yet familiar with IBEPS USA Certification Committee, our mission is to improve quality control of building performance analysis, specifically for the use cases of code compliance and beyond code programs. Our committee has been working hard to create certification processes to accomplish this mission. Today, we'll share these proposed processes with you and give you the opportunity to provide feedback. We'll have time for Q&A at the end of the session, but we encourage you to take advantage of the public comment period, which is open until the end of October. I'll talk more about that towards the end of the webinar. Uh, our committee was founded to tackle some of the issues we see every day as energy modeling practitioners. Currently, there's a lack of consistency in how software tools are approved for use in code compliance analysis. There are minimal requirements for modelers to demonstrate that they're qualified to be performing the analysis, and there are numerous challenges associated with the review of models that are submitted. Our committee set out to find solutions to these challenges. Our main objective over the last year or so has been to develop frameworks for certifying software tools, modelers, and model reviewers. Looking ahead, our goal is to find effective ways to implement these certification processes in partnership with authorities having jurisdiction, or in other words, the parties who enforce code compliance. Our efforts started with the thorough review of past and present certification initiatives. Our goal was to identify best practices and lessons learned that we could build upon. We then assembled three working groups to, to develop draft certification frameworks. <clears throat> Each of the working group leaders will be walking you through these proposed frameworks and available to answer questions at the end of the presentations. But before we jump in, I'd like to thank the US Department of Energy for sponsoring these initiatives. DOE support has been instrumental in providing IBIPSA USA with the resources needed to carry out this work. Now, I'll turn it over to Alan May, who will walk you through the modeler certification framework. Um, thanks, Dimitri. Um, a quick overview of the model qualification framework. Uh, basically, we're trying to establish a energy model or qualification framework that can be hosted and maintained by a certifying body. And this framework could be adopted by HJs across the nation. Um, Dimitri, next page. Um, some background, uh, why do we think um, a model of qualification framework could be um, could be something we wanted in you know in the industry? Um, just some background. Um, right now in the US, if you submit an energy model for co-compliance permitting, uh, almost um, no jurisdiction require a uh, qualification or certification or credential. Only a few, few jurisdictions in the U.S., um, I believe Denver, uh, Washington, and city of Houston. Uh, uh, Washington and Denver, they require a BMP, and city of Houston require a P uh, stamp. And that's the three jurisdiction uh, I personally know that, you know, there is something in place. But, you know, uh, with that being said, in most jurisdictions, almost anyone can run an energy model, and that could be um, uh, could be problematic. And um, a very important piece of this framework um, actually is um, responsibility and ethics. Um, you know, uh, if you if you go through PE or uh, RA. Uh, licensing process, you know, there is a big piece talking about, you know, what you should do and what you shouldn't be doing. And I think that's also uh, very true to um, energy modelers, right? Energy modeling is a process of integrating architecture and MEP um, and sequence, you know, building operations. And uh, it's a pretty complex process and uh, a lot of complaints from AHJs and some other programs, um, are that you know a lot of energy modelers manipulate the model in a certain way that you know making incompliant design to comply and you know a lot of energy modelers are not aware of the liability in co-compliance work but i wanted to remind uh, a lot of modelers out there that um, 
you know, most state law, state laws mandate the adoption of building codes, and energy code is one of them. Meaning, um, you know, if you do um, compliance work uh, to get a permit for your project, you have legal obligations um, to run those models to the best of your ability. Uh, there is a liability component uh, behind that, and I believe in the AEC industry, everyone knows, you know, how important that is. Um, and we totally understand that there um, are limitations to energy models, uh, and there are certain ways of modeling certain things. And we told you know we we, we acknowledge that, and so uh, reasonable assumptions are totally fine. Um, and some of the jurisdictions in the U.S. they actually have pretty detailed submittal requirement, like uh, you know again using city of Denver uh, as an example here. Uh, that they have pretty detailed submittal requirements that you need to provide, you know, detailed model inputs and assumptions. Uh, I think that is a pretty good step, you know, to make sure the model, um, the model is done per, you know, 90.1 or IECC uh, or other, you know, rule, uh, rule sets. Um, the core piece uh, of this um, qualification framework is a score system. Uh, we recognize that um, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of very very experienced modelers out there. Uh, they might not have a uh, credential, they might not have a license, but they're very experienced. They can do um, very good. They can build very uh, great energy models. So this uh, score system basically emphasizes project experience. Um, there is no mandatory credential or license uh, requirements like P or BMP, uh, but we we do recognize you know having a B or uh, P or BMP is great. So we give you uh, we do give you points for those. Um, the goal is to uh, have you know minimum ten points. You know there is one. Uh, we basically showed 10 combinations here, possible scenarios that there is one scenario, uh, scenario 10, that if you don't have any credential, uh, but if you have more than 20 project experience, uh, you still qualify. Um, and you know, another reason is because, you know, if you look at how many BMPs in the U.S., um, uh, it's less than 400. So we wanted to level the... Um, uh, the play field. Um, since we're talking about project experience, uh, what kind of experience um, is considered as acceptable? There are a lot of different type of modeling and a lot of different type of analytics. Um, uh, the working group uh, basically had a pretty, you know, uh, pretty good discussion about, you know, the types of modeling work. And we uh, basically line up um, with 90.1 or IECC requirement. If you go to, you know, the ECB or um, a PRM or um, C407, um, you can see that there are certain requirements um, for the modeling and simulation uh, process. And basically whole building energy modeling uh, is acceptable. But other modeling like shoebox modeling daylight modeling and CFDs, and a lot of people do spreadsheet-based, you know, uh, analytics, um, they're not considered as acceptable. Uh, well, let me change the, change the wording here. Not considered as qualifying experience. Uh, those experiences are great, but not in the context of um, detailed co-compliance modeling. Um, also, another piece, uh, this might be a little, uh, wanted to make it less controversial, but, you know, we also recognize that there are so many tools on the market, right? You, you know, uh, there are pros and cons of each tool. Um, it's a very, uh, it's it was a hard topic uh, during, you know, in the working group discussion because um, it's hard to find a list of tools that we think, um, uh, you know, uh, because we're also developing the software framework. And, you know, um, so we went to the uh, um, DOE website. DOE has a list of tools for 179D. Um, 
179D uh, tax deduction, right? That list uh, is a pretty pretty com comprehensive list uh, that contains uh, most of the common tools uh, we use on the market. And, you know, um, we also talk about um, basically any other tool. Uh, if it's not on the list, uh, it's not deemed um, acceptable. And this list could change. Um, last, so the last item was uh, we need to ident identify a certifying body, right? Someone has to host this framework and to maintain this framework. Um, and you know there is a, a you know if some someone wants to apply uh, to be on this you know uh, directory of qualifying modeler, you know the certifying body has to review the documentation um, and approve or you know or reject. Um, and also, uh, we recognize this is very. Uh, uh, this is a relatively new framework, and a lot of uh, HJs and programs they they don't know about it, right? So, we, uh, most importantly, this certifying body should uh, promote this framework, and we uh, hopefully we will see broader adoption in the future. Yep, that's it. Thank you. Okay, I will go over a quick overview of the software certification, but before I got started, I see there's an attendee with their hand up. If you have a question, please uh, type it in under the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and we can answer it there or discuss it later. Um, so software certification, um, what our, our goal was, was to come up with a list of software that satisfies a set of requirements. Um, you go to the next page, Dimitri. So the, the reason we stated it like that is that we're not trying to certify software that says this, this is a great software to always use. We, we need to certify it to a list that says this software meets this you know, list of requirements. And, you know, in a review of that, I mean, Ashley Standard 90.1 is the, the most referenced standard that has very specific software requirements. So that was our sort of our starting point at developing a certification uh, program. So that was we, once we had that decision, we you know we we could decide how how would a certification program for software work, and we decided that um, we could develop the specifications for a program around the requirements both of Appendix G and Chapter 11 of uh, Standard 90.1, and then um, starting with um, the 2019 version of 90.1, which is currently the most referenced version of 90.1, and then you know modify those requirements to you know include 2022 and 2016 and other versions in the future. And uh, with this, you know, having both Appendix G and um, ECB software could decide they want to certify against one or the other, or both. So, um, you know, the, the submission process for uh, software certification would be to develop a, a web portal where, you know, all the required documentation could be uploaded by the, the software developers. Um, and, you know, if we look at the requirements of 90.1, this basically comes down to two different documents. One stating that the software does meet all of the very the specific requirements of 90.1 and all of the required output reports from standard 140 tests that are re required by 90.1. Um, the 90.1 references some older versions of 140 but at the, the 
with the submission of 140 output reports, we could automatically check those results versus the acceptance criteria that was published in uh, standard 140 2023. So once we have a submission process, then you want some form of review of that, um, of those documents. Um, the, the proposal is to only review the documents for completeness. Have they submitted all the documentation? Is it, you know, in the correct form and that? Otherwise, software vendors will self-certify that their responses are truthful. This is very similar to how the um, IRS 179D software certification program works currently. Um, we did discuss, you know, a full review of all of the responses, but um, we, the, the working group decided this would be a very time consuming process to review, uh, you know, everything that's submitted and review all the statements about capabilities and would be sort of cross prohibited in developing any type of certification program. So in place of that, you know, a detailed review process, we propose a, a challenge and appeal process on the submissions. So and anyone could submit a challenge um, for the truthfulness of a submittal. Um, this challenge would have to be, you know, fully documented and supported. It couldn't just say, "I don't, I don't believe this." They'd have to say why, give validation. That challenge would then go to the software event, uh, vendor to allow to respond to that challenge, and then a review committee would be formed that would review that challenge and any response, and then decide whether they you know, uphold the challenge and remove the certification or reject the challenge and leave the certification um, up. So that is, you know, a, a, a process that is added that currently doesn't exist in any other certification program. So we're trying to add it to give, um, you know, more confidence in the, the process. So once you know everything's been submitted, reviewed for completeness, um, then it's necessary to you know make a public list of website that have of software that has met all of these requirements. Um, and this website should list all the software and the versions that have been submitted that meet the criteria, and then include if there have been challenges, responses, and decisions that should be posted uh, along with all the documentation so people can understand, you know, that what has been submitted and, you know, responses. Um, there was a big question of, especially as we move into, you know, more web-based software that might have, you know, a new version every day, uh, multiple times a day. And the question was, when would new software need to be certified um, and the, the guidelines we came up with were if it's a major release of the software or if it results in any changes to the you know, 90.1 requirements document that's filled out or if it results in any changes to the standard 140 results. Um, somewhat different than the other um, certification programs being described here, uh, this, this Development of this certification is um, beginning um, a, a, a portal to do the 140 acceptance criteria is already complete and live on the Abyssal USA website. And we're just kicking off a project funded by DOE to develop the portal for the 90.1 certification. So if you have any comments or questions, uh, please submit them well, either in the Q&A or actual on the review document. Uh, all right, so uh, I, I'm next and I will talk about um, QAQC provider and uh, reviewer certifications. And uh, I wanna start by providing a little bit of a background um, 
So before the, the first uh, undertaking of the BIP certification committee was to uh, review uh, the existing practices uh, for uh, model certification, uh, review certification, software certification. So as part of this effort, uh, we uh, reached out to uh, jurisdictions beyond code programs, uh, also um, incentive programs, green building programs to, to see uh, uh, how they handle these matters. Uh, we also looked at uh, certification programs, uh, national certification programs, including ESHE uh, BAMP, Building Energy Modeling Professional Certification for Energy Modelers, IRS Section 179D uh, practices for uh, approving simulation tools. Uh, we also very closely looked at uh, ResNet, uh, HERS model, uh, to, to see if uh, something similar could be uh, put in place for uh, commercial and multifamily buildings. So um, the uh, outcome of this uh, research uh, is documented in the scoping study that is posted uh, on EBIPSA website. So a, a lot of the uh, requirements uh, that were developed uh, for modeler, for software, and especially for QAQC provider and review certifications are informed uh, by this study. So one of the important takeaways uh, from this study was that um, uh, market-based uh, framework uh, requires uh, certifying both QAQC provider organizations and individual reviewers. So uh, just to clarify, uh, market-based uh, model uh, refers to how uh, the efforts are funded. So uh, we think that it's important to come up with a mechanism to ensure that, uh, and we already received a couple of questions on that, uh, that there is funding uh, and there is a plan uh, on how uh, this uh, uh, model or software review certification be maintained, uh, how, uh, how we would fund uh, reviewing uh, applications from software tools or modeling professionals or reviewers to come up with the list of approved providers. So um, that, that, that's why uh, we thought that uh, having or, or targeting market-based um, model is uh, very important. Um, so, uh, in the following slides, I, I, I'll describe at the high level uh, the content of um, QAQC provider and reviewer uh, seed document that was developed by the uh, BIPS Certification Committee Working Group. Uh, this uh, framework is uh, generally modeled uh, after ResNet uh, and uh, EPA uh, multifamily uh, program. Uh, next slide, please. So, so I, I'll start with uh, few definitions that describe key components of this uh, QAQC uh, framework. Uh, so so uh, performance-based compliance QAQC providers <coughs> are, are companies uh, that are accredited to perform submittal reviews on projects that use modeling to document compliance with code or beyond code programs. So conceptually, uh, QAQC providers are analogous to uh, ResNet rating providers or, or uh, EP multifamily review organizations. Um, so uh, the next uh, very key component of this uh, QAQC framework is the certifying body. So cert certifying body is an organization responsible for developing and maintaining uh, the provider, uh, QAQC provider accreditation process, overseeing uh, QAQC provider accreditations and performing uh, quality assurance uh, and quality control of providers work. So uh, certifying body is uh, analogous to ResNet uh, for ResNet HERS program or EPA for uh, the uh, Energy Star multifamily program. So, so currently, 
there is really uh, no uh, national uh, certifying body uh, analogous uh, to ResNet uh, that is widely accepted. T typically, uh, each uh, jurisdiction, each incentive program uh, basically uh, come up with their own rules. Uh, they, they, they would use uh, some uh, national modeling standard that is adopted into local code, uh, such as ESHA 90.1 or ICC. Uh, they uh, sometimes uh, come up with uh, uh, guidelines on uh, who can uh, uh, do the model, uh, but, but oftentimes, as uh, Ellen indicated, uh, it's uh, kind of anything goes approach. Uh, in terms of uh, reviewers, uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, many jurisdictions uh, don't have uh, uh, in-house uh, skills uh, to perform uh, submit reviews for projects that use energy modeling. So uh, some uh, jurisdictions uh, just uh, kind of trust uh, submitter, which uh, may or may not be a good idea. Uh, uh, so, uh, so there is really no uh, national uh, certifying body that is uh, trusted uh, by uh, individual adopters of energy modeling uh, for commercial buildings in a way uh, that ResNet is trusted. Uh, and I have a slide. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I have a slide coming up, not about ResNet, but about uh, Energy Star program, how uh, Energy Star uh, program requirements are used by various other entities. So, um, so, so what we are hoping. Uh, to uh, establish a certifying body <clears throat> like that. So next, uh, submit reviewers are uh, professionals uh, uh, that are affiliated, you know, for example, employed by QAQC provider organizations uh, who are actually responsible for reviewing projects uh, that use uh, modeling. Uh, so submit reviewers are analogous to ResNet raters or ResNet. Uh, I think ResNet now have uh, special certification for uh, modeling professionals. Uh, and uh, another analogy is uh, submit reviewers that uh, work uh, for multifamily review organizations uh, approved by EPA. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, QAQC provider uh, role, uh, so the key role uh, is to facilitate review of submittals. Uh, oftentimes, uh, different uh, jurisdictions, different beyond code programs that use energy modeling have uh, different requirements in terms of how uh, rigorously uh, they want the submittals reviewed. You know, for example, some uh, want uh, uh, energy models to be submitted and reviewed. Uh, others want simulation reports to be submitted and reviewed. And um, so, so it differs. So, so the uh, QAQC providers ha have to be able to uh, perform review uh, uh, you know, f following the uh, agreed upon uh, protocol and rigor. Uh, uh, another responsibility um, is to develop and implement a submit a review quality assurance process. Uh, so so uh, typically there would be multiple uh, reviewers uh, uh, reviewing uh, modeling submittals. So, so the uh, QAQC provider ha has to ensure that uh, this uh, reviews uh, are quality reviews and uh, uh, that, that there is consistent approach used across all reviewers. So the next responsibility is to uh, develop and implement a submit a review dispute resolution process. So if there is a disagreement between model and reviewer, how is this disagreement resolved? Uh, so QAQC provider also have to communicate uh, with uh, energy analysts, modelers, and the certifying body. Uh, uh, also, uh, that they have to maintain uh, contact with the certifying body to ensure that they uh, adhere to uh, its rules. So uh, in the seed document, uh, you will find uh, application to become an accredited QQC provider. 
the uh, description of initial uh, accreditation process, renewal process, and termination process. Um, also, uh, one of the feedback uh, we received from the committee, uh, from EBIP certification committee, was uh, that uh, they asked to us to define uh, tentatively uh, different uh, levels of rigor uh, that may be used to review submittals. So the SEED uh, document uh, provides um, three tiers of uh, uh, review rigor process. So from tier one, uh, least rigorous to tier three, most rigorous, uh, that um, uh, programs that use uh, modeling uh, can adopt. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, so in this slide just um, provides a, a, an example of a certification program and, and certifying body that uh, kind of re received national uh, recognition. So, so, so far, I mostly talked about ResNet, but this is another example. So Energista uh, multifamily uh, program uh, originally um, uh, have been doing all uh, the reviews uh, in-house. Uh, but uh, over time, they found that it could be uh, quite costly, uh, so they can uh, no longer sustain it. So they wanted to switch to market-based model. So um, they uh, devised this um, framework uh, where uh, they approve uh, companies that they call multifamily review organizations uh, to perform reviews. So multifamily review organizations are analogous to QA, QC providers uh, mentioned on the previous slides. So um, a, a, a multifamily review organizations uh, are funded by, uh, basically get paid uh, by projects that uh, they review. So they negotiate the cost uh, of this review. Uh, multifamily review organizations must follow uh, review uh, rigor uh, defined by uh, EPA. Uh, so EPA uh, uh, provides kind of the steps and scope of uh, what needs to be reviewed. Um, and uh, EPA uh, performs uh, quality assurance by uh, reviewing, re-reviewing a random uh, sample of uh, projects that are approved by multifamily review organizations and that ensures that uh, this multifamily review organizations uh, do a quality job because they want to stay uh, uh, accredited by EPA. So uh, uh, th 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 that means that they have to uh, do quality work with coordinating individual reviewers to maintain uh, review rigor expected by EPA. So and here on uh, the lower part of the slide are at least different programs that um, uh, use uh, e EPA established framework so they uh, require uh, uh, projects to engage with multifamily review organization uh, and uh, you know to perform reviews so, so that uh, illustrates that this model can actually be uh, adopted uh, nationally similar to uh, ResNet. Uh, next slide please. Uh, so, so, and I want to uh, finish by discussing the submit review qualification uh, that um, uh, the, the working group developed. So, so again, submit reviewers are professionals uh, that are affiliated uh, or employed by uh, QAQC provider organization. So, who uh, and alternatively, potentially, um, if jurisdictions uh, want to do. Uh, reviews in-house, then they can apply uh, this uh, qualification requirements to the internal staff or third-party reviewers that they engage with. So just like uh, Ellen described for uh, model qualification, what we use uh, points system. So uh, the only mandatory components of this point system is uh, for the uh, professional to take uh, training uh, on the applicable modeling standard, you know, for example, if model is uh, uh, for uh, 90.1 compliance, uh, then it would be training on uh, modeling protocols in 90.1. Uh, 
Uh, another mandatory training is on uh, compliance documentation uh, so that reviewer has a full understanding of uh, what uh, needs to be submitted uh, to a reviewer. Uh, and from there, uh, we have uh, two uh, uh, we have two uh, accreditations uh, that can be used towards the uh, point counts. So the first accreditation is uh, ASHA uh, BAMP, uh, and um, this is worth uh, 20 points. Uh, and ASHA BAMP requires both uh, relevant experience and um, it involves passing exams, so that's why uh, uh, we ended up assigning a uh, good number of points to it. And then uh, another accreditation is uh, uh, BESA uh, accreditation, which I believe has been discontinued, but uh, we still put it uh, on there. So uh, in, another uh, potential to earn po points is to take a submit or review uh, training. And uh, the last two categories are for uh, hands-on experience. So um, the, the, the experience uh, requirement can be met by either uh, completing um, a certain number of uh, modeling projects following uh, applicable protocols or, or uh, by uh, completing a certain number of uh, submit reviews. Um, or on uh, modeling projects. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, so, for example, um, someone uh, can take uh, mandatory uh, trainings, uh, have a BAMP uh, certification, uh, and review uh, five projects uh, to earn 30 points. So, this is example one. Example two is someone completing mandatory trainings. Uh, 10 hours of submit review trainings uh, and uh, uh, 10 uh, project reviews uh, plus uh, three uh, energy models. Um, so, so, and we uh, deliberated quite a bit um, on uh, who, you know, what, what kind of experience is necessary. And um, initially, uh, we, we thought someone who reviews um, models have to uh, have modeling experience themselves, so they need to be a uh, modeler first. Uh, but um, we, we had several jurisdictions uh, involved on the uh, working group, and they pointed that uh, oftentimes uh, they just don't have a uh, budget uh, to, to pay salaries that are expected by modelers. Uh, so, um, and they also uh, have uh, already have some reviewers on staff who they thought were doing a good job uh, with submit the reviews. So uh, this point system is uh, you know, compromised between uh, different uh, perspectives. Um, so uh, that, that's all I had. Thank you. All right, well, thank you everybody for those presentations. Um, hopefully everything was clear to the audience, but we do have time now for some Q&A, uh, but before we open up the floor for questions, I'd like to share these links, uh, which I think will be posted in the chat as well. So if you visit the first link, you'll see that all the framework documents that we just described are available for download. And then the next three links, one for each framework document, allow you to formally submit comments. And we strongly encourage you to submit written comments because that way we can have um, a documentation on feedback that was received and we can actually you know make sure that we address everything that comes up. So if you do have a question that comes up today in the Q&A, uh, even if you get a you know which I'm sure will be an excellent answer from our speakers, uh, we still encourage you to submit it so that we have a formal record of it. Um, so please do visit these links or bookmark them and check them out later. Um, so with that said, let's uh, go ahead and start to answer the questions. And uh, Neil, I think you said you were going to monitor the Q&A. Do you want to announce the, uh, the questions? Uh, yeah, I can. Um, I, don't, I don't. I think people can see the answers that have been typed already. Um, do we want to kind of go over them individually? Or do we want to open the floor up to additional questions? 
questions or follow-ups? Um, well, I haven't been looking at the Q&A since I've been uh, presenting. So there are any that you'd like to highlight and, uh, you know, read to the audience in case people miss them. I think that'd be useful. Um, but if others do have questions that they'd like to ask in real time, uh, we'd encourage you to raise your hands and we can call on you in the order you raise them. Yeah, I can point out a few that are in here. Um, Jason uh, Glazer was asking about the, the modeling qualifications that are listed now in an addenda to standard 209. Um, and Alan pointed out that 209 is, it, well, this, this effort is largely related to the um, certification for, for compliance analysis and 209 is more for general design, um, but it is, is probably worthwhile trying to coordinate a little bit. I think a lot of the same references are in both locations and um, you know, maybe the modeling credentials could be aligned a little bit more, but. Um, and if other people who have been answering questions want to highlight any, feel free to do that. There's there's been a, some discussion on on software just related to the explicit requirements from ninety point one, and how how detailed how rigid are those. Um, so it sounds like there's going to be a follow up on the software side. Um, Tim's going to reach out to the um, energy cost budget com subcommittee to to get some clarifications on if you can't meet all of the criteria. Does that mean that your tool can't be used at all, or does it mean it just can't be used to to model those specific features of a building. Yeah, I think that'd be a good clarification to include for sure. Yeah. Um, and Dimitri, if you want to stop sharing, um, we can put the QR codes for the links up. Yep, I can do that. And I believe our attendees are able to raise their hands, right? If they have questions. I think I saw one up earlier. So if we want to open it up to other questions. And I think some questions are still coming in. Alan, do you want to, there's, there's a good conversation kind of ongoing between you and David Griffin. Do you want to speak to that right yes, now? Yes, I was, I was typing. Uh, thanks, Neil. Uh, David, great question and great comment. Yes. Um, so um, I think the effort of this qualification framework is really a mechanism for a certifying body to host and then adopt by HJs. And AHJs can tailor this framework, um, you know, based on their specific requirements. If they say, "Hey, uh, if you did the model, you're submitting this model for permit, you should you should sign your name." Um, and also, I wanted to clarify that, um, you know, this is different from design licensed professional like PE or uh, RA. Uh, they are licensed and they're protected by state engineering and architecture laws. They have their authority. So um, this framework does not um, replace that authority. Uh, if there is a conflict that, hey, the HJ required, you have to be a licensed professional to sign off and stamp this document. Um, and I do not think this, you know, energy model or professional uh, should do that. Um, but if, we, if they do have a specific requirement, hey, you do, did the model, sign your name. I think um, that should that should be the case. You should sign your name. And uh, if I can ch chime in, and this is Maria, um, we had a lot of discussions around uh, that when we were developing uh, 90.1 compliance form. Uh, for uh, section 11 appendix G. 
and <clears throat> so in the feedback uh, that we got there is that uh, uh, generally most adopters would like to see uh, some uh, you know signatures uh, confirming uh, who did the work and um, the, the approach we used in the compliance form and they can uh, include link to the compliance form in the chat uh, but, but um, the, the design professional uh, signs the compliance form to confirm that uh, uh, description of uh, project design included in the compliance form matches design documents uh, and then modeler uh, also signs the uh, compliance form to indicate that uh, uh, th 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 this uh, design is what uh, was modeled uh, in the simulation tool. A and um, modeler signs for both, uh, uh, you know, to confirm that they correctly model uh, design uh, based on uh, what was described and also that they followed the uh, rules of the applicable modeling protocol, 90.1 section 11 or appendix G. Uh, and there is comment stating your name is different from providing your signature. Uh, so, so, so this is uh, this is made, meant as uh, sign off, design professional sign off and modeler sign off. So that's how it's uh, worded in the uh, in the compliance form. Um, David, I saw a comment um, that the current 90.1 ECB forms do not require a professional stamp of signature or the engine model signature. I think that's true for a lot of jurisdictions. Uh, we have done uh, a lot of submissions in uh, various uh, jurisdictions that very rarely they come back and say, hey, sign this or stamp this. Uh, but what we have been doing is that uh, you know, the ASHRAE forms, they have, you know, envelope, they have mechanical, electrical, plumbing, right? We, and those are the mandatory, you know, if you do the performance pass, you will have the mandatory provision up, still applicable to your design, to a project. So we would have the design professionals to uh, sign and stamp their section to confirm, hey, my design um, complies with applicable mandatory requirements because that's their responsibility, right? It's their liability, it's not my liability. And the engine modeler, um, what we typically do is we sign, uh, because if you look at the statement, our ECB form has a statement page, the first page, uh, the engine modeler, like, you know, I typically sign my name um, on that statement. Um, um, again, I wanted to use the Denver city of Denver uh, as an as example again here. Um, they have a spreadsheet submittal that every single professional, uh, including uh, design professional and the engine modeler, has to put their name in the spreadsheet, and then a um, the leading design professional has to stamp. I think that's a great way of demonstrating. Um, compliance and signature and, you know, professional CEOs. Um, I hope that, you know, uh, that is helpful. Yeah, I want to add that all of these um, working groups are ongoing. So if you're interested in, you know, going beyond just commenting on these forms, um, you can join the working groups and, and help craft the, the future of these documents as well. Um, and I believe um, there are some polls that that the presenters have prepared. I don't know if we if any of the presenters want to pick a specific polls to to launch to get feedback from the audience. Um, we could do it like that, or we could just launch them all um, at once or kind of sequentially. Does anyone have a preference? Let's go for the latter. Let's let's do them all. We're sort of getting short on time, so that's be a good opportunity to collect some feedback.
Okay, so people should have poll one up and should have had time to respond. Do we think we need to certify energy modelers for code compliance work? Okay. We'll leave these up for, for about 30 seconds. Yeah, I think it's okay to move on to the next one. I'm not seeing the answers as they come in, unfortunately. Poll two should be available. Which of the following do you think is the most important qualification that an energy modeler should have for code compliance work? It looks like on the last poll, 19% of people said that no qualification is shouldn't be required. It'd be interesting to get feedback from those people, um, either via one of the forms on the on the website or um, straight to the I think it's certification at abipsa.us is our committee email address. Yep, context is definitely helpful to these answers. So, you know, if you have a strong opinion, please submit it to us. Okay, poll three. Um, what organization do you think is a good candidate for the national certifying body? Um, for commercial compliance modeling. And again, if you choose other or something is not needed, please follow up with, with uh, substantiating comments. That'd be helpful. Okay, and the final question is ranking uh, submittal reviewer qualifications in order of importance. So we have a list of the various ones that look like they get chopped off, but you can uh, hover over to get the full text if you need it. Um, so go ahead and rank those. Um, you know, let's say um, five is the most, or let's see, do we wanna say five is the most important, one is the least important? Let's go with that. And this is um, this is the last poll question. So and while everybody's responding, once again, I'd like to thank all the speakers and all the attendees for joining today. I hope this was informative. Um, I really hope that you share some feedback with us through the, uh, con the, the comment submission forms. Um, we really look forward to addressing those through working group uh, meetings and you know, discussing amongst the, the entirety of the committee. If you are interested in participating in this committee, please do send me an email um, and you know, we'd happily add you to our distribution list. Uh, we do meet um, once every two months uh, with you know, the off months dedicating time for the working groups to meet. Um, so reach out to me. I can share more details about the schedule and uh, get you involved. So 
Thanks so much, everybody. Um, looking forward to reading your comments and moving forward with our committee's initiatives. So have a great day, everybody. Thank you.